Good morning. Good morning. Our reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time this morning getting back to the core of things. Getting back to the core of things. I don't know why, but it seems like the older I get, the more I feel like I need to have a title for my sermons. Because I hadn't had it for at least a couple of decades. But if you all have noticed, the last few weeks I've been having titles. So the title for this week is Getting Back to the Core of Things. And I think what I want to do is spend some time reminding ourselves, reminding us about what is at the core of our faith, what our faith is about, who we are as a people of faith, and who we are as persons, individuals of faith. Now, there have been very many interpretations of what it meant to be a Christian. All you have to do is look at the Bible, right? If being a Christian meant one thing, we would have one gospel. If being a Christian meant one thing, we would have one letter from Paul. We would have one letter from John. We would have one letter from James. If it was all one thing, we would just have one of each. But there's been a diversity of thought from the very beginning. So the diversity of thought is not um, unchristian. In fact, it's the most Christian thing you can do because that's at the core of our faith. It's having a different understanding about what the stories about Jesus meant about what the history of our faith is, and those are all shaped by our denomination, our tradition, and the culture in which we find ourselves. There's nothing particularly holy about any one thing, because in their broad, broad diversity, they demonstrate the holiness of God that permeates all things. And all of these have coexisted peacefully for the most part, but sometimes in history, um, there have been conflicts, and there doubt will, doubtful will be them until the end of time. But, and I'm going to put a big but here, to each generation it falls to bear witness that while there is this diversity in the Christian practice of faith, while there is this diversity, there are some things that we hold on to as being at the core of the faith, being at the core of what it means to be Christian, being at the core of what it is that we are gathered to do when we witness to Christ. And to each generation that falls to bear witness to that, the way of Jesus and its public embodiment and it falls witness to us to bear witness when it has lost its way. Now, I would say we are in such a moment in our society. How do you know when you are in such a moment when the public proclamation of the Christian faith has lost its way? When it's begun to sort of migrate to something else from the core of the faith? And I would suggest that it is when the public witness of the faith is about domination and power. When the proclamation of the faith is about who you rule over and who it is that you have power and against. That, that when that becomes the core of the Christian message, we've lost our way. When the crushing of the human spirit becomes the public proclamation 
of the faith, we have lost our way. And when the making small of the least powerful within our society, when making the most vulnerable people within our society the object of hatred and scorn, we have lost our way. Now, one of the things that the church has always believed is that we are no better than the best of us and we are no worse than the worst of us. So there is no saying, oh, that's a Christian over there. They're not like us. Or we're the real Christians. They're the ones who are just playing on TV and on Christian broadcasting stations across the nation. It is always us, which is why it is that we can't just walk away and we can't just write off the public proclamation of our faith when it loses its way. Now, while it has taken uh, many forms throughout history, when it lost its way in Germany in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, when it lost its way during the Crusades, when it lost its way during the debate over slavery, as if there really is a religious debate over whether or not people ought to be slaves. So there have been times that it has lost its way. Now in our context, it rages as the struggle against white Christian nationalism, which we find washing over our society, which wants to say three things that are anathema to the Christian faith. Number one, that God is not the God of the entire universe, but only the God of this nation. That, it, that God is the God of this people and no other people. The second thing is that the idea that there is something meaningful about the difference between us in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, in God's eyes, is anathema to the Christian faith. And when I use the word anathema, I'm not just doing my 75 cent word there and, and doing that. No, I'm saying that it goes against the very core of our faith to say that anything that is the physical difference between us, God actually takes notice of that and blesses that. We are simply different in color and language because of human migration because of weather conditions where people planted themselves, because of the environment within, they, within which they live themselves, it is not theologically significant. And anyone who tells you that God cares whether you are white, black, or any other color, any shade of brown or what have you, that God cares of, and God's love is given to you based on that is telling you a lot. And the third thing that is anathema to the Christian faith and anathema to the core of the Christian faith is that how people respond to the callings of their hearts in terms of how they love, who they love, and all of which in terms of creating themselves in the world is lying as well. So those, and those are the three pillars of white Christian nationalism. Number one, that God is an American God and nobody else's. Number two, that God is the God of white folks and everybody else is just a stepchild. And number three, that God only blesses heterosexual couples who have 2.5 children. <laughs> everybody else is shit out of luck. Right? But those are the three pillars of white Christian nationalism. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but today I wanted us to spend some time getting to what I think is the core of the Christian faith, precisely because at this moment in history, the power of that movement is every bit as strong as the power of the German Christian movement in the 1930s and 40s. It's every bit as strong as the pro-slavery movement in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. It's every bit as the ideologies and theologies behind the Crusades were in their time. Now the project of taking over a nation in the name of Christianity that's rooted in these ideas of race, gender, and domination 
and using the power of government to marginalize and impoverish those who live differently, believe differently, and love differently, and speak differently, is at the core of what Christians have to embody an alternative to. So it's not simply enough for us to say that, oh, they're wrong. We have to live in a different way that demonstrates that there is a way to be Christian, that you love your neighbor, no matter what your neighbor looks like. There actually is a way to be Christian, that you rejoice the fact that people find love in their lives. I remember when my daughter was young, and uh, she was just learning about the diversity of human sexuality. And she asked me, well, uh, how do you, you know, what do you think about it, Dad? And I said, you know what, Kiara, I love your mother. I really do. And I would not deny that to anyone, that they would have that in their lives, that they would have in their lives, that they could have someone who lives in their heart and whose heart that they can live in. So as long as it's not predatory and as long as it is uplifting, love whoever you want because God made us so that we could be vessels and embodiments of love. Now in some, a part of what I'm suggesting is that what white Christian nationalism does is it not only denies the parenthood of God of all people, right? It doesn't just deny the fact that we're all God's children and we're all beloved of God's children, but it would make God so small and it would make God so tiny that the God that they end up saying is God isn't worth anybody's worship because if that's all that there is, you could get a dime to a novel that will give you that. <laughs> now, when I look at our text with one, one of the things I want to suggest is that it reminds us of what is at the core of the Christian faith. It reminds us what is at the core of what it is that uh, it, uh, uh, we believe as Christians. And it is the story of the ministry of Jesus. And here, I want you to notice this, is that the entire text is a text about how Jesus and the good news makes people whole how it is that the good news restores people by healing them and by feeding them and by calling them out from the shadows so that they might live fully into the glorious creation which God has made them. That's what's at the core of our faith. That's what the story of Jesus is. Now, just so you know, I'm not just proof texting up here because, you know, preachers will do that. <laughs> I want you to notice that throughout scripture, whether we're talking about the healing of the blind man in John chapter nine, whether we're talking about the healing of the woman with fibroids. Now most of us heard the story as a woman with the issue of blood, but of course we know that that was just a very bad, I won't say just because a bad case of fibroids is never just, but I mean that, so he healed her as well as the healing of the ten lepers, as well as the healing of the disabled man at the pool of Siloam, as well as the healing of the centurion's daughter, as well as the healing of the mentally anguished man at Gethsemane, who we described as the demoniac. And I could go on and on and on. Wherever Jesus showed up, people were made whole. And that is at the core of what is the good news, right? The good news is not that God has chosen people who look like me to lord it over everybody else. The good news is not that God has chosen people who have, through some luck of working in a particular economic system, have means that others don't have. God has not ordained that those means that I'm better than everyone else. No, these are the points that are at the center of our faith. 
Now recall that throughout all of the Gospels, and this is one of the things that they all agree on, is that whenever Jesus showed up, people were made whole. Whenever Jesus showed up, people were filled. He didn't just fill the spirit, he filled the body as well. And it was all to restore the humanity of those often left at the margins of society. That's what the other piece of our text is about. The other piece of our text is that the people were like lost sheep with no one to care for them, no one to watch over them. And Jesus came as a beacon from God that indeed God had not forgotten them, that God was still loving them and that God had a future for them. Now I want you to notice that the thing he did not do, and you cannot find this anywhere in the Gospels, you cannot find a Jesus who lived, taught, or preached a religion of domination, a religion of having rule over other people. So when I say that it is at the core of our faith that this is not the teaching of Jesus, this is what I mean, is that any practice or proclamation of the Christian faith that calls you to hate your neighbor, that calls you to seek domination over your neighbor, that causes you to seek to take what little your neighbor may have is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's something else. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of theological differences about doctrine and that sort of thing. I'm talking about the lived story that we have in the gospel. So ours is living a public witness to a belief in God that restores people's humanity, not robs them of it. Our calling is living a public witness to a belief in God that always finds room at the table for one more, and not one that closes the table so that the hungry will be as hungry when they came as when they leave, and not taking the bread from the hands of hungry children. I will be honest with you. And, you know, we say in our prayer confession that we love everybody, no matter what you believe, no matter how you vote, no matter how you think, no matter how you love. But I have a hard time loving folk who would disband school lunch programs just so the children will be hungry because their parents haven't um, uh, had the good fortune of uh, succeeding economically or for whatever reason. I, I'm going to be honest with you, I have a hard time with that. I mean, we can have our political differences, but the children didn't choose the circumstance into which they were born. The children didn't choose the zip code into which they were born. The children didn't choose the educational attainment of the families into which they were born. And to pretend as if our society and we as the church have no responsibility for them, I think is one of the most godless things that you can do. We are also called to have a living witness, a belief in God which celebrates the rich diversity of God's children, not one that demands that people be ashamed of where their family comes from, what is the language that they speak? What's the melanin content that you have? Whether you're light or you're dark, who you love. The gospel of Jesus calls us to celebrate all of that and not to find it as a reason to denigrate and to push people into the shadows. In our time as in every time, God needs some people, some laborers, as our text talks about it. God needs some laborers to stand up as witnesses to the way of Jesus, 
to the way of wholeness, to the way of healing, to the way of making human beings everything that God has intended for each and every one of us. Now the text says that the harvest is full, and that is true, and the laborers are few. And that is true too, because you know it's easy enough to write a check to the charity. It's easy enough to click the button for a GoFundMe campaign. It's easy enough to text 773 to some phone number that you didn't know about five minutes ago. It's easy enough to do all of that. But what kind of laborers God needs in this world today are the ones that in every walk of your life, you are walking it as a witness to the value, to the inestimable value of your neighbors. Wherever you live at, wherever you work at, wherever you shop at, you should be a living witness to God's love in this world. Every now and then, you'll have the opportunity to do something special. You'll have the opportunity to go on a march or to do something. And when you have that opportunity, do it. But I can tell you as a veteran of many marches, you feel good at the end of the day that you've been a part of seeing something materialized that wasn't there before. But what God needs are laborers that in the everyday walk of life in the everyday walk of where you live, how it is that you move, that you are witnesses to God's abundant life. Because that is what changes the world. We have things that catalyze, such as movements, such as marches, such as particular sorts of campaigns. But what sustains that is when everyday people bear witness in their everyday lives to the power of God's love to call forth all of those who have been shunted to the shadows, to heal all of those who have been broken hearted, to give strength and courage to those whose hearts have been broken, to be able to be witnesses that no matter how well funded a movement is, as is the white Christian nationalist movement, if it is not the love of God, it is not the gospel. So, I know that you all are not used to me drawing stark lines, but I'm drawing a stark line today and I'm calling out to each of you to live your lives as embodiments of God's love, embodiments of God's hope, and embodiments of God's precious care for all of God's children and all of God's creation. Because that is what will get us to the world that God so desperately desires and not keep us mired in the world that only gives us nothing but shattered hopes and broken dreams. Amen. Amen. Amen.